The lobotomy was one of the most brutal commonly practiced surgery procedures of the modern world, and while it started off with good intentions, it eventually became immersed in controversy until it was finally banned across the world. Welcome to Infamous Episodes, this is the story of the lobotomy. The history of the lobotomy begins with Igas Maniz, a Portuguese neurologist who is credited with developing the controversial procedure. In the 1930s, Maniz observed that symptoms of some mental illnesses were related to disruptions in brain circuits. This included conditions such as schizophrenia, severe depression, bipolar disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. This sparked his interest in finding a treatment that could alleviate patients' suffering. Building on this idea, Maniz conducted groundbreaking experiments involving frontal lobe surgeries. His goal was to sever neural connections, believing it could improve psychiatric conditions. In 1935, Maniz introduced the leukotomy, a surgical procedure that involved drilling holes into the skull to access and manipulate the brain. The procedure was based on the theory that disruptions in certain neural connections in the brain were responsible for mental illness. By severing these connections through surgery, proponents of the leukotomy believed that it could alleviate emotional distress and improve behaviour in patients. The leukotomy was initially designed as a last resort for patients who did not respond to other treatments. Maniz believed that his procedure had the potential to offer hope and relief to individuals who had previously been deemed untreatable. On November 12, 1935, at the Hospital Santa Marta in Lisbon, the audacious neurologist August Maniz decided to embark on a series of daring operations that would forever change the landscape of psychiatric care. With hands impaired by gout and lacking formal neurosurgical training, Maniz sought the assistance of Pedro Almeida Lima, who he had previously worked with. Their mission was to explore the the intricacies of the human brain and address the challenges of mental illness. Their focus was on the frontal lobes, the mysterious regions linked to fundamental aspects of human behaviour. Their plan involved delicately removing certain elusive long fibres connecting the frontal lobes to other brain centres. With determination and necessary preparations in place, Lima led the surgical procedure with precision, carefully navigating through the skull's defences. The atmosphere in the room was filled with anticipation as he approached the subcortical white matter of the prefrontal cortex. Lima injected ethanol into the brain, targeting the connecting fibres known as association tract, which play crucial roles in human cognition and emotion. Moniz, showing excitement, referred to it as the frontal barrier, an audacious medical milestone with the potential to make history. Following the initial operation, Moniz found reason for hope as he believed the patient's depression had eased, leading him to declare her cured. Yet the reality remained elusive as she never left the confines of the mental hospital. Despite the uncertainties, Moniz and Lima pressed on, injecting ethanol into the frontal lobes of seven more patients, yet they encountered challenges, having to repeat procedure on some individuals to achieve what they considered favourable outcomes. Unyielding in their pursuit, they sought a better approach. Enter the leukotome, a surgical instrument that would mark a significant turning point in their journey. This formidable cannula, measuring 11 centimetres in length and 2 centimetres in diameter, featured a retractable wired loop. With each rotation, it created a 1 centimetre diameter circular lesion in the frontal lobe's white matter. With determination and curiosity, curiosity driving them forward, they decided to etch six legions into each lobe, hoping to gain deeper insights into the mysteries of the mind. However, the uncharted territory of the human brain meant that the outcomes remained uncertain and unpredictable. Lima's unwavering commitment led them to consider multiple procedures, possibly leaving numerous lesions on the left and right frontal lobes if they weren't satisfied with the initial result. In the swift span of a few months, Maniz and Lima conducted a bold series of leukotomies on 20 patients. The urgency of their mission led Maniz to publish his findings in March of the same year. These 20 patients, aged between 27 and 62 years old, entered the realm of this groundbreaking procedure, seeking relief from their mental burdens. Among them, 12 were women and 8 were men, each battling different conditions, including depression, schizophrenia, panic disorder, mania, catatonia, and manic depression. Time proved to be of the essence as patients arrived at Maniz's clinic, facing the life-altering decision to undergo the leukotomy. They were operated on swiftly, their fate intertwined with the skilled hands of their daring surgeon. Within 10 days, they returned to the Miguel Bombarda Mental Hospital, their for lives forever altered. Yet their journey was not without tribulations. Complications emerged, manifesting as increased temperature, vomiting, bladder and bowel incontinence, diarrhea, and ocular affections such as ptosis and nystagmus. The psychological effects left indelible marks as well. Apathy, akinesia, lethargy, timing, and local disorientation, kleptomania, and abnormal sensations of hunger were some of the issues that the patients were left with. Through it all, Maniz stood resolute 
irresolute, asserting that these effects were fleeting, mere whispers in the grand tapestry of medical advancement. His assessment painted a picture of hope, with 35% of patients showing significant improvement, another 35% somewhat better, and the remaining 30% unchanged. There were no deaths, and Moniz proclaimed that none of his patients had suffered deterioration following the leukotomy. The winds of change carried the leukotomy to the doorstep of the medical community, but its reception was far from warm. The Brel Cid, a witness to the first leukotomies performed in Lisbon, took a staunch stance against the new technique, denouncing it with fervour. He decried the procedure, claiming that the patients returned to his care were diminished, their personalities degraded. He dismissed Moniz's theoretical foundation as nothing more than cerebral mythology, attributing any observed changes to mere shock and brain trauma. Across the seas, Paul Corbin, a Parisian psychiatrist, echoed concerns about the mutilation of an organ, doubting its capacity to improve function. He sounded a cautionary note, warning of potential risks including meningitis, epilepsy, brain abscesses that loomed on the horizon for those subject to leukotomy. However, amidst the echoes of skepticism, Moniz stood undeterred, buoyed by his reported success with 15 out of 20 patients. The allure of this groundbreaking procedure spread like wildfire, taking root in far-flung corners of the world. Brazil, Cuba, Italy, Romania, and the United States all ventured into the uncharted waters of the leukotomy, embracing it experimentally as they sought to fathom its potential. With Italian medical practitioners in the vanguard of change, the leukotomy underwent experimental modifications with remarkable speed. Mauro Fiamberti, a divisionary medical director of a psychiatric institution in Varese, made a significant breakthrough in 1937. He crafted the transorbital procedure, a daring approach where the frontal lobes were accessed through the eye sockets. This method involved puncturing the thin layer of orbital bone at the top of the socket, providing a gateway to inject alcohol or formalin into the frontal lobe's white matter. While occasionally substituting a leukotome for a hypodermic needle, Gamberti boldly forged ahead, performing approximately 100 leukotomies before the onset of World II. Gamberti's pioneering innovation would echo through the annals of medical history, where it laid the groundwork for Walter Freeman's future development of the transorbital lobotomy. The leukotomy, once a daring endeavour by Moniz, now stood poised on the precipice of further evolution, guided by the audacious spirit of those who dared to challenge the limits of medical science. In 1936, neurologist Walter Freeman and neurosurgeon James Watts performed the first prefrontal leukotomy in the United States at George Washington University Hospital. Freeman's interest in psychiatry was sparked during his appointment as medical director of research laboratories of the Government Hospital for the Insane. Exhaustively researching the neuropathological basis for insanity, he chanced upon Moniz's preliminary communication on leukotomy in 1936. Encouraged by Moniz, Freeman initiated the correspondence, eventually receiving Moniz's monograph on leukotomy. Reviewing it anonymously, Freeman praised the procedure's potential, proposing that it could address functional issues of the brain's internal wiring rather than seeking diseased brain tissue. In 1937, Freeman and Watts adapted the surgical technique, creating the Freeman-Watts precision method, a pioneering step towards the future of frontal lobe psychosurgery. In the world of medical innovation, the Freeman-Watts prefrontal lobotomy stood as a significant advancement. However, at this point, it still required drilling holes into the skull, which meant skilled neurosurgeons and well-equipped operating rooms were required. Freeman wanted to simplify the procedure so that it could be provided to patients in state mental hospitals without operating rooms, surgeons, or even anesthesia. In a moment of inspiration, Walter Freeman was struck with a bold idea, approaching the frontal lobes through the eye sockets instead of drilling holes into the skull. Undeterred by the unconventional approach, he embarked on a daring experiment, testing the concept on a grapefruit with a homemade instrument. As a result, the transorbital lobotomy was born. Freeman lifted the upper eyelid and positioned the surgical instrument, called an orbitoclast, underneath. The swift motion of a mallet drove the orbitoclast through the delicate layer of bone, penetrating the brain along the bridge of the nose. Precision was crucial as the instrument delved 5 centimeters into the frontal lobe, then pivoted at an angle towards the opposite side of the head, cutting with purpose and precision. Between 1940 and 1944, a total of 684 lobotomies were formed in the United States. However, driven by Freeman's unwavering wavering promotion and zealous effort, the numbers skyrocketed towards the end of the decade. In 1949, the lobotomy reached its peak popularity in the US, with 5,074 procedures undertaken. By 1951, over 18,000 individuals had undergone this life-altering surgery. Nevertheless, not everybody embraced Freeman's methods. His partnership with James Watts dissolved in 1947 due to his transformation of the lobotomy into a routine office procedure, drawing criticism and concern. Regardless, Freeman's relentless advocacy for the technique continued, and its impact was swift and significant. During this period, disturbing patterns 
emerged. Shockingly, an estimated 40% of Freeman's patients were gay men, tragically subjected to lobotomies in an ill-conceived attempt to change their sexual orientation. This revelation cast a dark shadow over the already contentious history of this procedure, highlighting the complex ethical dilemmas and human impact involved. Lobotomy had a significant impact worldwide, with around 40,000 procedures formed in the United States, 17,000 in England, and approximately 9,300 in the Nordic countries of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden combined. Sweden alone conducted at least 4,500 lobotomies between 1944 and 1946, mainly on women, including young children. The majority of Japan's lobotomies targeted children with behaviour problems. Swedish psychiatrist Snor Wolfhart, evaluating early trials in 1947, warned, it is distinctly hazardous to leukotomize schizophrenics, casting doubts on the procedure's effectiveness for chronic mental disorders. Norbert Wiener, author of Cybernetics, or the Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine, couldn't help but remark, prefrontal lobotomy has recently been having a certain vogue, probably not unconnected with the fact that it makes custodial care of many patients easier. Let me remark in passing that killing them makes their custodial care still easier. The cold reality of the lobotomy's growing popularity shook the medical world. The Soviet Union took a bold stance in 1950, officially banning the procedure, denouncing it as contrary to the principles of humanity, lamenting that through lobotomy, an insane person is changed into an idiot. The echoes of that decision reverberated across the globe. In 1951, Freeman posed for a photograph while performing a lobotomy, which led to the surgical instrument accidentally penetrating too far into the patient's brain, devastatingly ending their life. In 1967, Freeman formed his final lobotomy on a long-standing patient, Helen Mortensen, who was receiving her third lobotomy lobotomy, Freeman. Following the procedure, Mortensen suffered a brain hemorrhage, as did as many as a hundred of his other patients, and sadly died. As a result, Freeman was finally banned from surgery. By the 1970s, other countries and several US states followed the Soviet Union, joining the chorus of those banning the lobotomy, seeking to protect patients from its potential harm. In 1977, during President Jimmy Carter's tenure, the US Congress formed the National Committee for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. Their investigation investigation into psychosurgery, including lobotomy techniques, was shrouded in controversy. Though the committee recognised limited benefits, they urged restraint, wary of overstepping ethical boundaries. The Nobel Prize awarded to Moniz, described as an astounding error of judgment and a terrible mistake by Torsten Weissel, fueled cause for the Nobel Foundation to reconsider. Yet the prize remained, while the foundation continued to host a contentious article defending the lobotomy. As you might expect, there are a few notable cases of the lobotomy. Rosemary Kennedy was the third child of Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. and Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy, and she was born in 1918. Unfortunately, Rosemary suffered from intellectual disability abilities and behavioural challenges, which became more apparent as she grew older. As she reached her late teens, her parents sought a solution to help her live a more manageable life. In 1941, at the age of 23, Rosemary underwent a prefrontal lobotomy performed by Dr. Walter Freeman and Dr. James Watts. The procedure, which was meant to calm Rosemary's emotional outbursts and make her more manageable, had devastating consequences. Instead of improving her condition, the lobotomy left Rosemary severely disabled and unable to care for herself. She lost her ability to speak, walk, and function independently. With her mental capacity diminished to that of the two year old child. The lobotomy performed on Rosemary Kennedy was shrouded in secrecy for many years. The Kennedy family went to great lengths to keep the details of Rosemary's lobotomy hidden from the public and shielded her from the media spotlight. After the lobotomy was performed on Rosemary in 1941, the Kennedy family did not disclose any information about the procedure to the public or even to their closest friends and associates. Instead, they chose to maintain an aura of secrecy around Rosemary's condition and whereabouts. The family's main concern was likely protecting the Kennedy name and reputation, as they were a prominent and influential political family at the time. Even Rosemary's siblings were kept in the dark about the full extent of her conditions. Her sister Eunice was one of the few family members who had regular contact with Rosemary. Eunice later became champion for the rights of people with intellectual disabilities and founded the Special Olympics in Rosemary's honour. It wasn't until many years later in the 1960s and 1970s that some details about Rosemary's lobotomy began to emerge. Biographers and historians started in investigated and writing about the Kennedy family, the stories of Rosemary's lobotomy slowly came to light. However, the full extent of the procedure and its impact on Rosemary's life remained largely hidden from the public until after her passing in 2005 at the age of 86. Another notable lobotomy case was that of Howard Dulley, one of the youngest recipients and survivors of the transorbital lobotomy. Walter Freeman diagnosed Dulley with childhood schizophrenia since age 4, despite numerous other medical and psychiatric professionals not detecting any disorder. In 
in 1960, Freeman carried out a transorbital lobotomy on 12-year-old Dully on the instruction of his father and stepmother, who paid $200 for the procedure. Following the lobotomy, Dully was institutionalized for years as a juvenile due to behavior problems, later incarcerated and eventually became homeless and an alcoholic before cleaning up his act and getting a college degree. But it wasn't until his 50s that Dully sought to find out the details of what happened to him as a child. Due to the after effects of the surgery, Dully was unable to recall the memories of what happened, and by this time his stepmother and Freeman were both dead. In 2007, he published a memoir called My Lobotomy, detailing how the procedure impacted his life and his search for the truth. Thanks for watching. Let us know your thoughts about this controversial and frankly brutal surgery in the comments below. If you're interested in learning more about the lobotomy, I've included links to further reading in the video description or you can scan the QR code on screen. This includes Howard Dully's memoir, My Lobotomy. Please remember to like the video, subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell to stay updated on all of our latest episodes. We really appreciate it.